Crash Test Dummy from Wikipedia, the Free Encyclopedia, http colon slash slash en dot wikipedia dot org. Crash Test Dummies are full scale replicas of human beings, weighted and articulated to simulate the behavior of a human body in a vehicle mishap and instrumented to record as much data as possible on variables such as speed of impact, crushing force, bending, folding, or torque of the body, and deceleration rates during a collision. In modern times, they remain indispensable in the development of new makes and models of all types of vehicles, from family sedans to fighter aircraft. This article focuses on the role of crash test dummies in preventing injury to automobile occupants. Section 1. The Need for Testing On August 17, 1896, Bridget Driscoll became the first victim of an automobile accident when she was struck down and killed in front of London's Crystal Palace. Three years later, on September 13, 1899, Henry Bliss entered the history books as North America's first motor vehicle fatality when he was hit stepping off a New York City trolley. Since that time, in excess of 20 million people worldwide have lost their lives to motor vehicle accidents. The need for a means of analyzing and mitigating the effects of motor vehicle accidents on human bodies was felt very soon after the commercial production of automobiles began in the late 1890s, and by the 1930s, with the automobile a common part of daily life, the number of motor vehicle deaths was becoming a serious issue. Death rates had surpassed 15.6 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles and were continuing to climb. Vehicle designers saw this as a clear indication it was time to do some research on ways to make their products safer. In 1930, the interior of a car was not a safe place, even in a low-speed collision. Dashboards were made of rigid metal, steering columns were non-collapsible, and protruding knobs, buttons, and levers were ubiquitous. Seat belts were unheard of, and in a frontal collision, passengers hurled through the windshield stood very little chance of avoiding serious injury or death. The vehicle body itself was rigid, and impact forces were transmitted directly to the vehicle occupants. As late as the 1950s, car manufacturers were on public record as saying vehicle accidents simply could not be made survivable. The forces in a crash were too great and the human body too frail. Section 2. Cadaver Testing Detroit's Wayne State University was the first to begin serious work on collecting data on the effects of high-speed collisions on the human body. In the late 1930s, there were no reliable data on the response of the human body to extreme physical insult, and no effective tools existed to measure such responses. Biomechanics was the field barely in its infancy. It was therefore necessary to employ two types of test subjects in order to develop initial data sets. The first test subjects were human cadavers. They were used to obtain fundamental information about the human body's ability to withstand the crushing and tearing forces typically experienced in a high-speed accident. To such an end, steel ball bearings were dropped on skulls, and bodies were dumped down unused elevator shafts onto steel plates. Cadavers fitted with crude Accelerometers were strapped into automobiles and subjected to head-on collisions and vehicle rollovers. Albert King's 1995 Journal of Trauma article, Humanitarian Benefits of Cadaver Research on Injury Prevention, clearly shows the value in human lives saved as a result of cadaver research. King's calculations indicate that as a result of design changes implemented up to 1987, cadaver research has since saved 8,500 lives annually. He notes that for every cadaver used, each year 61 people survive due to wearing seat belts, 147 live due to airbags, and 68 survive windshield impact. However, work with cadavers presented almost as many problems as it resolved. Not only were there the moral and ethical issues related to working with the dead, but there were also research concerns. The majority of cadavers available were older Caucasian adults who had died nonviolent deaths. They did not represent a demographic cross-section of accident victims. 
Deceased accident victims could not be employed because any data that might be collected from such experimental subjects would be compromised by the cadaver's previous injuries. Since no two cadavers are the same, and since any specific part of a cadaver could be used only once, it was extremely difficult to achieve reliable comparison data. In addition, child cadavers were not only difficult to obtain, but both legal and public opinion made them effectively unusable. Moreover, as crash testing became more routine, suitable cadavers became increasingly scarce. As a result, biometric data were limited in extent and skewed toward the older white male. Section 3. Volunteer Testing Some researchers took it upon themselves to serve as crash test subjects. Colonel John Paul Stapp, USAF, propelled himself over 630 miles per hour, or 1,010 kilometers per hour, on a rocket sled and stopped in less than a second. Lawrence Patrick, a now-retired Wayne State University professor, endured some 400 rides on a rocket sled in order to test the effects of rapid deceleration on the human body. He and his students allowed themselves to be smashed in the chest with heavy metal pendulums, impacted in the face by pneumatically driven rotary hammers, and sprayed with shattered glass to simulate window implosion. While admitting that it made him, quote, a little sore, Patrick has said that the research he and his students conducted was seminal in developing numerical models against which further research could be compared. But while the data from live testing was valuable, human subjects could not withstand tests which went past a certain degree of physical discomfort. To gather information about the causes and preventions of injuries and fatalities would require a different kind of subject. Section 4. Animal Testing By the mid-1950s, the bulk of the information cadaver testing could provide had been harvested. It was also necessary to collect data on accident survivability, research for which cadavers were woefully inadequate. In concert with the shortage of cadavers, this need forced researchers to seek other models. A description by Mary Roach of the 8th SAP Star Crash and Field Demonstration Conference shows the direction in which research had begun to move. Begin quote. We saw chimpanzees riding rocket sleds, a bear on an impact swing. We observed a pig, anesthetized and placed in a sitting position on the swing in the harness, crashed into a deep dish steering wheel at about 10 miles per hour, end quote. One important research objective, which could not be achieved with either cadavers or live humans, was a means of reducing the injuries caused by impalement on the steering column. By 1964, over a million fatalities resulting from steering wheel impact had been recorded, a significant percentage of all fatalities. The introduction by General Motors in the early 1960s of the collapsible steering column cut the risk of steering wheel death by 50%. The most commonly used animal subjects in cabin collision studies were pigs, primarily because their internal structure is similar to a human's. Pigs can also be placed in a vehicle in a good approximation of a seated human. The ability to sit upright was an important requirement for test animals in order that another common fatality among human victims, decapitation, could also be studied. As well, it was important for researchers to be able to determine to what extent cabin design needed to be modified to ensure optimal survival circumstances. For instance, a dashboard with too little padding or padding which was too stiff or too soft would not significantly reduce head injury over a dash with no padding at all. While knobs, levers, and buttons are essential in the operation of a vehicle, which design modifications would best ensure that these elements did not tear or puncture victims in a crash? Rear-view mirror impact is a significant occurrence in a frontal collision. How should a mirror be built so that it is both rigid to perform its task and yet of low injury risk if struck? While work with cadavers had aroused some opposition, primarily from religious institutions, it was grudgingly accepted that because the dead, being dead, felt no pain, and the indignity of their situations was directly related to the easing of pain of the living. Animal research, on the other hand, aroused much greater passion. Animal rights groups, such as the ASPCA, were vehement in their protest, 
and while researchers such as Patrick supported animal testing because of its ability to produce reliable, applicable data, there was nonetheless a strong ethical unease about this process. Even though animal test data were still more easily obtained than cadaver data, the fact that animals were not people and the difficulty of employing adequate internal instrumentation limited their usefulness. Animal testing is no longer practiced by any of the major automobile makers. General Motors discontinued live testing in 1993, and other manufacturers followed suit shortly thereafter. Section 5. Dummy Evolution The information gleaned from cadaver research in animal studies had already been put to some use in the construction of human simulacra as early as 1949, when Sierra Sam was created by Samuel W. Anderson at his Alderson Research Labs, ARL, at Sierra Engineering Company, to test aircraft ejection seats and pilot restraint harnesses. This testing involved the use of high acceleration to 100 kilometers per hour, or 600 miles per hour, rocket sleds, beyond the capability of human volunteers to tolerate. In the early 1950s, Alderson and Grumman produced a dummy which was used to conduct crash tests in both motor vehicles and aircraft. Alderson went on to produce what he called the VIP-50 series, built specifically for General Motors and Ford, but which was also adopted by the National Bureau of Standards. Sierra followed up with a competitor dummy, a model it called Sierra Stan, but GM, who had taken over the impetus in developing a reliable and durable dummy, found neither model satisfied its needs. GM engineers decided to combine the best features of the VIP series and Sierra Stan, and so in 1971, Hybrid 1 was born. Hybrid 1 was what is known as a 50th percentile male dummy. That is to say, it modeled an average male in height, mass, and proportion. The original Sierra Stan was a 95th percentile male dummy, heavier and taller than 95% of human males. In cooperation with the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, GM shared this design, and a subsequent 5th percentile female dummy, with its competitors. Since then, considerable work has gone into creating more and more sophisticated dummies. Hybrid 2 was introduced in 1972, with improved shoulder, spine, and knee responses, and more rigorous documentation. Hybrid 2 became the first dummy to comply with the American Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard, FMVSS, for testing of automotive lap and shoulder belts. In 1973, a 50th percentile male dummy was released, and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, undertook an agreement with General Motors to produce a model exceeding Hybrid 2's performance in a number of specific areas. Though a great improvement over cadavers for standardized testing purposes, Hybrid 1 and Hybrid 2 are still very crude, and their use was limited to developing and testing seatbelt designs. A dummy was needed which would allow researchers to explore injury reduction strategies. It was this need that pushed GM researchers to develop the current hybrid line and hybrid 3 family of crash test dummies. Section 6. The Hybrid 3 Family Hybrid 3, the 50th percentile male dummy which made its first appearance in 1976, is the familiar crash test dummy, and he is now a family man. If he could stand upright, he would be 168 centimeters, or 5 foot 6 inches tall, and would have a mass of 77 kilograms, or 170 pounds. He occupies the driver's seat in all the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, IIHS, 65 kilometers per hour, or 40 miles per hour, offset frontal crash tests. He is joined by a big brother, the 95th percentile hybrid 3, at 188 centimeters, 6 foot 2, and 100 kilograms, or 223 pounds. Miss Hybrid 3 is a 5th percentile female dummy, a, di a diminutive 152 centimeters, 5 feet tall, and 50 kilograms, or 110 pounds. The two hybrid 3 child dummies represent a 21 kilogram, 47 pound, 
six-year-old, and a 15-kilogram or 33-pound three-year-old. The child models are very recent additions to the crash test dummy family. Because so little hard data are available on the effects of accidents on children, and such data are very difficult to obtain, these models are based in large part on estimates and approximations. Section 7. The Test Process Every hybrid 3 undergoes calibration prior to a crash test. Its head is removed and a 40 centimeter bounce test is performed. Then the head and neck are reattached, set in motion, and stopped abruptly to check for proper neck's flexure. Hybrids wear chamois leather skin. The knees are struck with a metal probe to check for proper puncture. Finally, the head and neck are attached to the body, which is attached to a test platform and struck violently in the chest by a heavy pendulum to ensure that the ribs bend and flex as they should. When the dummy has been determined to be ready for testing, it is dressed entirely in yellow, marking paint is applied to the head and knees, and calibration marks are fastened to the side of the head to aid researchers when slow motion films are reviewed later. The dummy is then placed inside the test vehicle. 44 data channels located in all parts of the hybrid 3, from the head to the ankle, record between 30,000 and 35,000 data items in a typical 100 to 150 millisecond crash. Recorded in a temporary data repository in the dummy's chest, these data are downloaded to computer once the test is complete. Because the hybrid is a standardized data collection device, any part of a particular hybrid type is interchangeable with any other. Not only can one dummy be tested several times, but if a part should fail, it can be replaced with a new part. A fully instrumented dummy is worth about $150,000 U.S.